There you go. Maybe, uh, Alex, could you pull the back left line there? Just get a little more light in here. There you go, that's it. Okay, so um, you can see the seahorse has fins that are really made for camouflage and not really much for movement. The seahorse is a kind of a master of camouflage. It sits hidden. And to find it kind of out in the open is pretty rare, but it can be done. Here's a diver with a seahorse. You see it's got a little dorsal fin on the back. It kind of pushes it forward. So uh, the book talked about mouth structure. Mouth structure also reveals the dietary preferences of fish. And if you look at the uh, top right of page 161, there's a chart showing mouth structure. Here it is. Barracuda eat other fish, and they have the sharp teeth and the mouth to do that. These butterfly fish, they have this long, <coughs> extended, pointy mouth, and it allows them to get into coral reefs, the little, the little uh, holes, the little shells that coral live in, and they can stick their mouth in there and eat the coral. And a slip mouth is kind of cool. The mouth can poke out and extend forward. The parrotfish has kind of a beak, and they can scrape off <coughs> chunks of coral and scrape the coral. And actually, it's a real, it's real strong, and it can kind of bite through the coral. The herring's a filter feeder. They have a big mouth that they can open and take in a lot of water and filter the water through their gills. I'm not going to show you this whole video, but it's a it's a vet school that look no it's not. Hang on, I got the wrong video on there.
the Barracuda had quite a set of teeth also. Right there, all the hair over there, but to open the mouth and see the teeth. We have a prepared one for last time, don't we? They have a big Barracuda. It's probably uh, informal and all. And we only do fresh fish here today. Sometimes you find the hook still in there. Barracuda meat is all right if it's from a young barracuda. But if it's an old one, you have to be careful because they concentrate the signature of poison from yellow fish. So barracuda are always following fish. Whatever fish they eat, if they have signature of poison in their flesh, they, they then concentrate it. They eat a fish about this size. This is about, I wouldn't eat any bigger than this because larger than this, they have too much signature accumulated. Depends on the size of the fish. A shorter fish will have a 
more curved intestine. And then this uh, area at the end here, you see this fish, it's the anus, you see in the shark, it's called the cloaca. Um, the, uh, the cloaca is kind of a word that means anus and genital area combined. It's, it's kind of a hole for everything, is, is what we call a cloaca. So, um, the, uh, the kidney there is, uh, filters the blood of wastes and releases its um, urine that the shark might create that comes out of the cloaca. So digestive, digestive waste comes out of the cloaca, pee comes out of the cloaca, and there, um, this is the gonad of the shark, which is the reproductive structure. So uh, eggs or sperm also come out of the cloaca. So it's kind of a, the cloaca is a one hole for everything. It's a little bit different than um, what we have in the fish here that has an anus that's one opening and then a different opening, the urogenital opening that has the pea and the sperm or eggs. So anyway, a fish's circulatory system has a two-chambered heart. We have a four-chambered heart, but they have two chambers. There's a, a chamber that receives the blood. Do you know what that's called? Anyone know from the same name as our chambers? The ventricle is the one that sends it away. The, the atria is the one that receives the blood. So blood comes into the atrium, and you can see it comes from the head and the rest of the body, and this blood is deoxygenated, it doesn't have any oxygen, and it pumps, and then the, the atria sends the blood to the ventricle, and the ventricle gives a big pump that pushes the blood into the gills. In the gills, the uh, blood picks up oxygen and becomes red. The red is oxygenated blood. And then the blood spreads out. Some of the blood goes forward to the head, and some of the blood goes back to the rest of the body. And then the blood will go down to the organs that need it. And so you see it's turning blue here. That means it's getting rid of its oxygen and then it comes back to the heart. They're just showing some of the capillaries. These little vessels are called capillaries. They're not showing at all. Actually, every area of the fish's body has a bed of capillaries, so every cell can get oxygen. So fish have a two-chambered heart. So a single pump sends it to the gills and back around so it can go back to the heart. Mammals and, uh, and birds and reptiles have more chambers than that because they need more pumps um, because of they're, they're more active than fish. Fish aren't quite as active. One of the reasons is fish can use the buoyancy of the water to help hold them up. If you're a mammal running around on land, you don't have the buoyancy of water to help hold you up. So you've got to use your muscles to hold you up and that requires more energy. And so you need more chambers of your heart to pump. So fish have, a two, fish have two chambered hearts. Uh, amphibians and reptiles have three chambered hearts. And birds and mammals have four chambered hearts. There's some exceptions to that. Crocodile, alligators and crocodiles have four chambered hearts like mammals. Amphibians actually have two chambers at when they're tadpoles and three chambers when they're adults. But for the most part, that's how it works. There's, a, there's quite a discussion in the book about how the gills work. And here's 
how the gills work. Uh, water, and th this is a shark here uh, showing water can come into the mouth. So this is like showing up at the top. This water here, that's coming in through the mouth. So the shark opens its mouth and water can come in there. Water can also come in through these spiracles, which you saw on your shark dissection. Remember the little holes? And water comes into the mouth cavity. And then the water, the water doesn't go down. They don't swallow the water. It comes right out through the gills. So you see, you follow those arrows there. It goes past, and these little things right here are the gills. <coughs> and so water is moving past the gills, and the gills have blood coming into it. There are blood vessels coming into these gills. And so basically, oxygen just diffuses into the gills from the water. And then the water comes out through the gill openings. And that water has less oxygen in it than when it arrived because the oxygen has been pulled out of the water, you see. Now some fish will actually have kind of a straining mechanism where they can strain the water here inside their mouth. Kind of like a, uh, a screen. And the water goes through the screen and any large organisms are trapped on the screen. And that's how they eat. That's, that's filter feeding. And they have a tongue that can just lick the screen off. And so they're kind of like licking their cheeks, getting all this stuff that's been caught on their little screen, and that's how they eat. That's how, this is how whales, a lot of whales do it. Like a blue whale, the biggest, the biggest organism in the sea is a filter feeder. And, uh, and, and a lot of other fish use that mechanism. Just taking water and filter feed. We saw the ray, the manta ray was a filter feeder. This is a, a bony fish, and remember bony fish have the operculum, the covering. And so they'll take in water and they'll squeeze their, their mouth cavity so, so that that mouth cavity kind of squeezes like that and that pushes the water out and the operculum comes open so the water can get out. And you can see their little gill filaments. See that word gill filament? These little things that hang down. Bony fish have a double gill filament, whereas cartilaginous fish have a single gill filament. If we cut, if we were to cut away the operculum, we would see the structure of the gills, and there's that double filament that I was talking about. And if you look up closely inside it, you can see the blood vessels. Blue is deoxygenated blood, that's how it comes in. So it comes in kind of through the bottom here, and then it breaks off into tiny little blood vessels called capillaries, and then kind of comes back together. Here is where it collects oxygen, and then it comes back together and goes back. So see they put a square here, and they've kind of blown it up so you can see how the movement is. Fish have an important way of straining more oxygen from the water. It's called countercurrent exchange. The, the flow of blood is going upward. Notice the flow of blood is going upward. And the flow of water is going downward. Do you notice how that's counter? They're, they're, the blood is coming up, but water is going down. And what this basically does is it exposes more blood to water. So you can get more oxygen. And we call that countercurrent exchange. If you're going in the opposite direction of something you're encountering, you encounter more of it. Traffic is a good example. 
If I'm counting cars that are going by me in the other lane, and I travel a certain distance, I'll encounter a lot more cars coming that way than I will that are in my lane because I'm moving along with them, you see. And so counter-current exchange is a way of the of the water of the blood getting more oxygen because it encounters more water <coughs> than if it's moving the same way. If this gill was structured where the the blood is moving down and the water is going down across it, it wouldn't get as much oxygen out of it. So that countercurrent exchange is a very important mechanism. Does that make sense? We see countercurrent exchange in a lot of organs, in a lot of organs, like the kidneys too. The kidneys will have kind of urine flowing this way and blood flowing the other way, so that the the release of of your pee gets more um, wastes in it than if it were moving the same way. Countercurrent exchange here. It shows it real well here. Direction of blood flow going up. Direction of water movement going down. What do you think about that? The next part of the book, and I'm, I'm just kind of running through everything here, it's page 165. It talks about how fish regulate their solute levels. And they do it differently. Do you all remember the percentage of salt that's in seawater? We already studied that. 0.35, very nice. 35 thousandths. Uh, seawater is 35 parts per thousand. Salt. And let's, let's think about a regular saltwater fish. The seawater is saltier than the fish's blood. The fish's blood is only about 14 parts per thousand. So how does the fish, so if you think about the blood, if the blood is 14 parts per thousand salt, and the seawater is 35 parts per thousand salt, we've got a little problem there. There's more salt outside the fish than there is inside the fish. And if you remember from regular biology class, there's a process called osmosis that works. Do y'all remember learning about osmosis? It's movement of water. Water tends to move towards salty areas. If I were to, to water my plants with salt water, it would literally suck water out of the plant into the soil and the plant would wilt up really quickly. You don't want to water your plants with salt water because of osmosis. And so what's going to happen in this situation with this poor fish here, the water's going to rush out of its body toward the saltier area. And this fish will quickly dry up and die. If it doesn't have any um, anything in place to maintain the water inside its body. And so it does have things in place to do this. One of the things the fish does is it drinks seawater and the gills remove salt from the water it's drinking. So it says salts excreted by chloride cells of gills. There are special cells in the gills that take salt and squirt it out. And then the fish takes the water that's now a lot fresher because it's had the salt removed and the fish swallows that and the water goes through its digestive system and is absorbed into the blood. And so the gills have an active job that they do excreting salt. That's, that's another function of the gills for fish. Get rid of salt from the water that they're taking. And freshwater fish don't have that. Yes, freshwater fish have just the opposite problem. A freshwater fish has 100% water that it's swimming in. 
And, and water tends to move into the body of a freshwater fish. So freshwater fish don't excrete salt from their gills. And that's why a freshwater fish won't survive in salt water. Because they, their gills aren't made for excreting salt, and when they get in salt water, they quickly dry up and, and lose all their, all their water to the environment. What about a saltwater fish in freshwater? Same thing. See, a freshwater fish... Um, what it does so that it doesn't gain too much water is it's constantly peeing out water. Those fish in that aquarium are having water rushing into their bodies from the fresh water that they're swimming in and they're just constantly peeing it out. And so they're swimming, you can't see the pee because it's clear, but they're swimming around there peeing all the time. Wouldn't that be a weird life? Peeing all the time, constantly. <laughs> well, you put, a, you put a freshwater fish in salt water and its body is adapted to constantly pee, it's going to die quick. Because in salt water, you don't need to be doing that. You need to, to maintain your water, not pee it all out, you see. So you can't put a freshwater fish in salt water and you can't put a saltwater fish in freshwater. It almost never works. There are only a few types of fish that are adapted to be able to live in both. And usually those are fish that go out to the ocean to breed and then they come back to the river to live. Or, or opposite, they come into the river to breed and then go back out to the ocean. There are a few types of fish that do that. We're going to talk about those. The, the American eel is one of them. Um, so anyway, uh, so another thing that the fish does to um, to make sure it take it keeps its water is that the kidney is um, it has evolved to maintain water. The kidney in a saltwater fish just just keeps the water in, and whenever it pees, it doesn't pee out much water. It pees out mostly salt. The pee of a saltwater fish is highly salty. And the gut, any food that it eats, any water that's in the food that it eats, the gut maintains the water and poops out the salt. So both the poop and the pee of a saltwater fish is really salty to, to help get rid of, of salt and maintain water. Now, that seems like a lot of trouble doing all that, doesn't it? Sharks have kind of a different way of doing it. Sharks just keep their blood 35 thousandths, 35 parts per thousand, the same as the seawater outside. So there's no <laughs> movement of water in and out. And how do sharks do that? They take one of their waste products, it's called urea, it's the yellow stuff that's in your pee, urea. And sharks produce it in their normal activities, and sharks put that urea, keep that urea in their blood until it reaches very high concentrations. And so their blood gets to about 35 parts per thousand salt and urea, and that's the same as seawater, so there's no net diffusion. And their body has adapted to live like that. So their kidneys do not get rid of urea. And their gills do not get rid of urea like might happen in a saltwater fish. But urea is a poisonous substance and it's hard for cells to survive with a lot of urea. So uh, it's just two different ways of doing it. So the book, the book spends a good, a good portion, three paragraphs there, talking about this osmoregulation. The next thing that they talk about is the nervous system of a fish. Fish have a very small brain. Look at it in comparison to its body size. Way smaller than, say, our brains in comparison to our body sizes. 
They all have a dorsal nerve cord, a cord running down the back. And they have nerves all over their body so they can feel things. This picture isn't in your book. I just kind of snagged it from a different part. I mean, it is. It's in a different part of the book. But they just, they, they don't have a picture that shows us. They just kind of talk about it in the, in the reading. Fish have nostrils. And their nostrils can smell. They have smell detectors inside their nostrils. But it's important for you to understand they aren't taking in air through their nostrils like we do. We take in air and get air to our lungs through our nostrils. They can't do that. There's not air under the water like that. There's oxygen diffused in the water, and that's taken in through the gills. So the nostrils <coughs> are just for sensing, sensing their environment. They'll also have smell detectors not only in their nostrils, but all over their face, too and lips that can smell the water, smell for chemicals and such. This is a lot of the way fish operate. They try and sense chemicals. You ever heard a, sh a shark can smell blood from one drop of blood in a huge mile of water, they can smell it? Yeah, that's because the blood gets in the water and the molecules spread out and the shark has detectors that can sense those molecules and it can kind of hone in on where the most molecules are and swim towards it. So it does, fish do have nostrils. They have um, uh, a lateral line. The lateral line helps detect current movements and such. Um, so there's a lot of sensory mechanisms in this fish. A lot of fish have an eye cover. You see it in, sh in all sharks. And there are some other fish that have this sort of thing. You also see it in, uh, <coughs> in um, some uh, amphibians and reptiles. Have a, we call this a nictitating membrane. Let me write that down. I should have had a on this slide here. Nictitating Three T's, nictitating membrane. And this is a protection. What happens when the shark strikes, the nictitating membrane closes over the eye because it's likely that whatever is striking might flap its tail and hit it in the eye. So the shark is watching what it's getting, and then that nictitating membrane kind of closes over the eye so it doesn't get damaged. Very often, the nictitating membrane is clear, so it can see through it to some extent. You see, that one's kind of clear a little bit. That one looks more opaque. So it just depends on the organism and how much protection they need. This shows, here's again the lateral line. You can really, this fish has a real definite lateral line. And all fish have this. And this is kind of a close up of how it works. This is, a, uh, this is an important thing to notice with fish. Here's where water comes <coughs> in. See, we're looking, we've cut out, and now we're looking at the surface. Here's the surface of the skin up here. And what happens is water comes in through this hole and goes through this tube and then comes back out. So this is the, an opening, a little hole in the side of the fish. And water comes in, and right here, there is a, uh, there's a bunch of cells that have, you see the cells here, that have little hairs coming off the cells. Little cilia is what we call them. And the cilia are embedded in a gelatinous um, little outcropping here. And that thing will bend, you see. If the water comes in and it's moving this way, that thing will bend to the right. And it'll bend these hairs. And these cells will feel the bending. And they'll send a nerve signal to the shark's brain or the fish's brain. And tell the fish, hey, 
the water current is moving. It's moving our little um, gelatinous thing this way. Or if it comes in this way and moves there, it'll bend it in the opposite direction. How's it going? You late? I have no dentist. You got a note? No, but I just signed it. You don't even need one? Um, so this little gelatinous uh, thing bending back and forth ends up sending messages to the brain, and it happens really fast. So as soon as it feel, as soon as that current pushes the water, bends these things, fish gets a signal, and they can move the appropriate way. Now, there's another cool sensory device on the nose of a shark. Here's the nose of a shark, and you see all those little black dots? They're called ampullae of Lorenzini, or ampullae. The ampullae of Lorenzini, this Lorenzini guy is the guy who first figured out what they're for. Those sense electricity. And sharks, and only sharks have this, not bony fish don't have it, but shark can sense electrical activity. And for instance, some fish will bury themselves under the mud, and a shark just kind of <coughs> slowly goes with its, with its beak, with its nose, just over the mud, and waits to feel electrical activity. Because organisms, as they move their muscles and such, or their heartbeats, there's electrical activity there. And that electrical activity is sensed in these ampullae, and it's another, it's, a, it's another sense that we didn't even know existed, because we don't have it. We don't have this sense of electricity. And so these are what the ampullae look like up close. There's a little pore, and somehow the electricity stimulates this nerve down here. I'm not exactly sure how it works. But that's what all those little dots are. They're not freckles. Sharks also have an ear. See that little hole there? That's kind of like an ear. And vibrations in the water go stimulate <coughs> fluids that's in these canals and vibrate the fluid in the canals and the shark can make sense of what's going on outside by the vibrations. That's kind of a scary looking shark, isn't it? The book talks a little bit about these organs. So, we're about out of time. Um, If you will read through page, looks like we got through 167 today. Read through there. I'll show you this little video about shark territoriality. And we'll talk about behavior next time. I know this is fish this territory. This strange though. resident of the Star Garden has an even stranger name. It's called a sarcastic friendship. And this one is looking for a new home. It prefers the security of the dam to being exposed out on the sand flat. This abandoned shell is perfect. Unfortunately, this rock is already home to another fringe head. sarcastic friendships make poor neighbors, especially when both neighbors are males. If the newcomer is going to keep his home, he'll have to fight for it. <laughs>